My name is Ian Skelly, and I'm a missionographer. I have traveled all over the world documenting the lives of missionaries. I've heard their amazing stories of faith and adventure. They are people who would dare to trust God and witness the impossible. Here are some of their stories. Hey guys, I just want to say welcome to another Missionary Stories, and uh, we've got some great people here with us today. Uh, we've got uh, Denise and Glenn Ellerby, uh, who are missionaries to Tanzania, and they've actually brought one of their uh, countrymen uh, here, uh, Victor. Uh, to be with them here in the States. So I guess, first of all, uh, we're so excited to have you in the, in the States here, but tell us how you guys got called to missions. Back in 2005, we were pastoring a church and uh, we invited this uh, man from Tanzania to come and minister in one of our services. And he asked us to come and visit him. And seven years later, we finally loaded up, went to Tanzania and spent a couple of weeks with him and his family, lived in the house with them. Uh, we ate at their table and we went to church and Glenn did revival. And while we were there, we went to Serengeti. We just had the whole African experience. And we come home thinking, okay, We've been to Africa, we've seen the animals, we, we've experienced the culture, and that would be the end of that. And the Lord began to deal with me uh, over several weeks about us going back as missionaries. But Glenn always said, what did you always say, Glenn? No, he ain't never going to be a missionary. He said he'd never be a missionary. So I knew that if I brought this to him, that he would say no. But the Lord just kept impressing me. And after about three weeks, I, I was at the table with him one morning. And I said, Glenn, I'm, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think God is calling us to the mission field. And he said, honey, I've been waiting on you to say something. <laughs> so he was waiting on me. And uh, so we called our, our our, uh, overseer and I was talking to him and, and I said look I feel like the Lord's calling us to be missionaries I said but are, aren't we too old and he just laughed he said no nah, you're not too old so here we are and uh, we became missionaries because of, of that person coming to our church That's awesome. yeah. and that young man that came was actually this young man's pastor yeah. he came and done the Macedonian call on me and made me have to go to Africa, but you know, I've I really enjoyed my time there and I'm happy to be a missionary. Yes. Um, it, it's a fulfilling engagement. Right. And so you hear about these stories of when, you know, when you're a little kid in, in Sunday school and the, the teacher's talking about, or even the pastor talking about missions and yes. you're like praying, please, Lord, don't send me to Africa. <laughs> and never anybody else, yes. <laughs> That's about the way it was. <laughs> right. So um, tell me about your first uh, trip there. Well, the first time we went, we were on a plane and we're thinking, it's been seven years. Is this guy really real? Is he really going to be there when we get off that airplane? But the thing is, it was a divine connection. And when we met him, the Holy Spirit did something within us. And so when we stepped off the plane and we got through all the mess you have to go through to get through customs and stuff, we walked out and there he stood with about half the church. And you never, oh man, we, I run to him, just grabbed him and hugged him. I was so excited to see him. And we spent uh, ten, about 12 days there, and we stayed in their home with him. Him and his wife moved out of the bedroom and gave us their bedroom. And Sister Chambo cooked for us, and uh, he uh, had Victor come and drive for us the whole week. So Victor became our driver. That's how we met Victor Campbell. Hey, everybody. It's uh, day two of our travels on to uh, uh, Morogoro, the little uh, village of uh, uh, in Topeka, uh, where Victor's family lives at. What did you think of these uh, Americans first time? Uh, actually, I was not expecting, but uh, the day Pastor announced it, he said, hey guys, you announced on the chat that uh, we're going to have the guests from America, Glenn and Denise. So we come up with the idea, okay, how we are going to meet with the Muzungus. We call the Muzungus the white man, but <laughs> <laughs> it's too far that that's the white man in right. Swahili. The thing is, uh, Victor is our, not only our driver, and he helps us with culture, and he's our national director for Tanzania and East Africa. Um, 
but because of the football that he did, he's traveled all over the country. He knows people in every place we go. He has contacts anywhere. And so we come into a place and it's late and we need a place to stay. Victor gets on the phone and calls somebody he knows and says, where's a good place to stay? Where can we stay that's cheap, reasonable, safe? And so he always has contacts. If we break down or we need something, well, he's... Or we're driving down the road in the middle of a village where you think, man, nobody lives out here. And all of a sudden, Victor rolls a window down. Hey, John, roll, roll, roll. <laughs> He does, he does. He knows people all over the country. And so, yeah, uh, God prepared him in a way that, that, you know, is unusual. So what has been the biggest challenge for you guys? The greatest challenge that we've had, I guess, for the, the missions itself is um, my part is, is asking for help. The, that's the greatest challenge that I face. I can, I can go over there and I can do the work and I can talk to the people and I can minister to the people. And that, for me, that's easy. It comes very easy. But when I get back here, I have a very hard time asking for help because I was raised independent. And uh, my dad believed that if you asked for money, you were stealing from people. So, and, and he instilled that in me. So I've had a hard time getting that out. And I know now, you know, what the Word of God says about uh, the blessings that come through giving and such as that. So uh, it, it's not as hard, but still, I have an issue with that myself. For me, it is a culture in Tanzania that I really struggle with because life is a different ebb and flow there and the way that they deal with things is completely different. And well, I'm American, I'm used to excellence. I'm used to, um, you know, everything being in a certain order and they're like very laid back. This is the way you wash clothes in Africa. No washing machine, no dryer. It's all by hand. And anytime you go to have, do anything, it's three trips. Three trips, unless it has to do with government, and it's six trips. So you can double that, and it's really true. I think that's, um, you know, because the American mindset is very, uh, time is money, get it done, we got a job. Yeah. Whereas uh, other cult, a lot of the um, Central America, Africa cultures are very, like you said, relational. Uh, let's just take the time. And, and I venture to say that relationships are more important than getting something done. It is. You know? It definitely and so is. in that aspect, you guys probably have a better uh, grasp on uh, the, you know, the, the, the right way to do things. Yeah. Um, so tell me about uh, maybe something that happened that you felt like, oh God, you're going to have to pull us through this one. God, God was really with us. God, God pulled us through and what I would consider probably some of the hardest times of our life really didn't have anything to, to do with the mission itself, but we're part of, we're part of God's family and, and he, he was with us the whole time. You know, um, being missionaries don't exclude you from having problems. Actually, it brings a few extras. <laughs> but, you know, um, God, is, God is very strong and God is very powerful. Uh, last year while we were on the field, God showed us just how powerful He was. He sent an angel to rescue us, you know, a physical angel. And I'll get Denise to tell you about that in a moment, but if you want to hear about it. But, uh, you know, God will show up personally if he has to, to do whatever he needs to do to bring you through whatever you're going through. Um, even though it's hard, it's not, it's not an easy task sometimes, God is always there. Um, he showed that to me, and, and one of my last messages that I, that I was actually in charge of, I won't say I preached it because I don't remember what I said, but I was preaching, I was preaching at a church, and just as I stepped up on the platform, God says, I want you to read this, and I, I had my message together, I knew what I was going to say, and he said, no, I want you to read this, so I stopped and I read that text before I'd done anything else, and what it was, it was the, the where Jesus was standing in front of the tomb of Lazarus and he was calling him out. And I read that text and I remember stepping up next to the, the pulpit and I put my left hand on the pulpit and that's the last thing I remember in that message. The next thing I knew, there was 500 people, the pastor and all his leaders was crying in the altars. That's the last thing I remember. 
Yeah. You know, so God done the work. I don't know what happened to me. I don't know where I went <laughs> or anything. That was just a God thing. You know, God proves Himself. He don't. He don't need us to do it. He just needs us to be willing to get out there and do it. Last year, we were on the mission field about uh, six or eight weeks, and the Lord spoke to us. We really didn't know what we were doing, of course, and we really didn't know what God wanted us to do. And He spoke to us and told us to go up into this village up on a mountain in a very remote area where Victor's family uh, is from. Uh, his mother lives up there, and to build a tabernacle for this little church, this pastor we had met, we had went through and visited with him when we first got there. And so we had been up there about two weeks, and we, we, it was just one disaster after another from the moment we left until we got ready to come down off the mountain. Everything that could go wrong went wrong, but we did get the tabernacle up, and so we're headed down the mountain. Hey everybody, this is Denise. We are in the truck. We've just left the village of Imtabila. We're traveling down the side of the mountain. We've been on the road about four hours now, and we're finally on black top. We're covered from head to toe with red dust. And we have a bridge. We actually have a river to cross that did not have a bridge. And there was a ferry that ran until 7 o'clock at night. And we needed to be there about 6. And we had about three hours to get there. And it's a two and a half hour drive. And we were making good time. We were getting there. And all of a sudden, the motor was running and the tires stopped turning. So we get out of the car, out of our truck and the axle is sticking out the back wheel about this far. Now we're in the middle of nowhere. There is a mud hut over here and a mud hut over there. There's no villages. There's no one to call. The people that we left up on the mountain do not have cars. They ride on bicycles or walk. There is no guest houses. There's nowhere to go. And here we are stuck on the side of the road. We have camera equipment. We have cash on us. We have all of our stuff. We're white. So we stick out. We're with them. Yeah, Victor was driving. Yeah, yeah. that's good. And it was it was a very scary. Were moment. you scared? Uh, actually, I was scared about these two. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah but I was. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, yes. we, we sacrificed them first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was thinking, okay, what are we going Yeah. White meat or dark meat? Let's go for a white. <laughs> and so we're standing there, and we're all in our own you know, moment of what are we going to do here and, and we're all troubled. What What's going to happen? How are we going to get this fixed? Uh, it's getting dark. The mosquitoes come out. Uh, are we going to have to sleep in the truck? How are we going to, how are we going to keep going back? How are we going to get this fixed? And we looked up and there, here come a man walking down the road and he was very portly and he was dressed in the tribal clothes. He looked like a Maasai. And he had a cow tied by the back leg. And I, I remember standing there talking to him and I kept looking at that cow and he kept pulling at that rope wanting to go. And they were holding on to him. There was another person with him and they were holding on to the rope. Glenn never seen him. And so this man, now we're in an area where no one speaks any English, nobody in this whole region speaks English. And this man walks up to us in perfect English and introduces himself and shakes our hand and, and you know, we share pleasant trees for a minute. And he looks at us, he says, don't be afraid. Everything's going to be all right. I'm going to take care of it. You don't have to worry. You will be safe. And what I didn't know is he pulled a motorcycle over, because they're going down the road every once in a while, and that's how people get around there, and put Victor on the back of a motorcycle and sent him to a man down the road who was a mechanic, the only one in the whole region that knew how to work on this truck. So we still had that, and I had a young lady with us that was helping me learn how to cook, because you don't have stoves like we do here in America in the villages. and. He went to her and told her how we could get across that river because the ferry stops at seven. There's no way across the river, and uh, and then he just told me and Glenn not to worry. Everything was going to be all right. So after several hours, Victor went and got a mechanic, and after several hours, this guy fixed this wheel. Cost us a whole twenty dollars. It was a little bit of nothing. In America, it could have cost a whole lot more. And so we get in the truck and we're headed to the river and we're we're riding down the road and. And we're all talking, how are we going to get across the river? Mary said, well, 
uh, I know how to get across the river. And we said, how do you know how to get across the river? She'd never been here before. She said, you know the man. I said, which man? She said, the man with the cow. He told me how to get across the river. So we get to the river, and there was a little road. And we went down the road and around the bend, and there was a construction bridge that we didn't know about. And there was a man that worked there that you could bribe, and he would let you <laughs> cross the river. So for about $5, he, he took us across the river. So we went and we found a place to stay and got up the next morning and we had to get to a city called Dodoma, which is our halfway point home. And so we traveled all day long and way into the night. The truck kept breaking down, things kept happening, but everywhere we had a problem, we would pull up and there was always someone there that could fix that problem. It was very, it, it was like divine appointments all along the way. So we come into this city, it's the capital city of Tanzania, and we're, we found a motel behind the, the parliament, which is concrete and there's no pasture land, it is very uh, much a city, and we stay in this motel right behind the parliament. Well, the next morning as we get up, as we're pulling out, Glenn looks and there's a man dressed in tribal clothes like a Maasai with a cow in the only ditch with grass eating, that cow was eating. And Glenn looked and didn't think anything about it. So we drive all day and I got sick and when we got to, got to Mwanza, we got back to our motel. Glenn got me in bed and got me all covered up and I was sleeping and he began to have an argument or fussing at God. And he's like, God, ever since we left on this trip, the tire went, you know, we had flat tires and the car wouldn't run. He began to address all of our issues. And at the end, of telling God everything terrible that happened to us while we were gone. He said, where were you? And before he could get that out of his mouth, God said, Glenn, I was with you every step of the way. And then at that moment, Glenn seen that man in Dodama, a full day and a half, a full day's drive away, was the same man that was up on the mountain on the other side of the river with that same cow. And he told Glenn, he said, I sent an angel to take charge over you. We had been reading Psalms 91 every day of ourselves. And God says in Psalms 91 that he will put his angels in charge of you. And he did that day. And it was, it was the beginning of, God was letting us know that even though we were halfway around the world, He was going to be there with us. And He may show up in strange ways, but He would always be there with us. And the strangest thing of all, we were getting ready to come home this, this time. Never seen a man with a cow tied by the back leg the whole time I'm in Tanzania this time. And we were driving to the airport and I looked and on the side of the road were two men dressed in tribal clothes with two cows tied by the back legs. And it's like God was saying, I got your back. Right. He's got his uh, angels around all over all the place. Over, <laughs> all over the place. So, yeah, God, God does, if he sends you, he not only equips you, but he also protects right. you. Right. So, Victor, what did you, what were you thinking during that whole thing? Yeah, it's actually, it's actually, it's about a good thing. You know, when somebody telling you about that, you may think uh, it's just a story, but I see it with my two eyes. Right. And actually, I did not expecting something like that to happen because it was hard. It was hard by the time when we were on the mountain. It was very hard, very mm -hmm. strange. So I learned a lot through the missionary, doing a missionary. Yeah, it's, I have a very wonderful experience about it. And, and now I'm ready to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, is after we got back and we sit down, all of us sit down and begin to talk about it, we would all go, yeah, you know, I really felt something. Because I did. I felt a peace come over me right. that I didn't have before when that man came. And I just, you know what I did? I quit worrying. I went and sit, in the, sit on the side of the road in the ditch and we just said, there's nothing I can do. I can't fix this. I, I'm, I have right. no control over my life right now. That seems to be the yeah. time, w for, for me anyways, as well when God steps in, when you just, you can't do anything. Yeah. You know? And, and, and uh, uh, what I can do is, the, uh, it's the miracle from God, uh, the, the, the track, the track, <laughs> the track. You know, we had a problem. We didn't know about that, but when we crossed the river, then we get somebody, then he told us that the problem of the track, it was the, uh, the gasket cylinder is finished. Now, can you imagine? We travel about a uh, hundred, I think 
seven, eight hundred kilometers from where we are up to Mwanza, and the gasket cylinder was finished. But we crossed the mountain. We, you know, you can't imagine. I, I sometimes when I was thinking about the trip, I was saying, ah, do we manage to travel from that far away to Mwanza? Yeah. Then we come back. You know, the the truck. When we opened the legend, it was full of oil, <laughs> water, but we drive the truck. It's right. almost a, a, a oh yeah. my God. So tell me about the um, miracles that you've seen happen in people's lives. We've had, we've had miracle after miracle after miracle take place in the altars and stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's just been, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you could talk about any, pinpoint any one that would be, you know, uh, something that's awesome. Uh, we seen we seen like the like the guy that that was healed with the heart attack. I mean, he was literally having a heart attack and laid hands on him and it just went away. You know, uh, we've seen stuff like that. We've seen people um, that was in, in a very bad way and God just miraculously take it away. You know. Uh, I got I got to the place where I quit looking for miracles and I quit looking for uh, people to come and, and get saved. I quit looking for uh, signs and wonders. I just done what God said for me to do, and then I backed up and watched God do it. You know, <laughs> so I, I wasn't I, I wasn't never pinpointing a particular miracle or anything like that that was happening, and and so it, it made it it made it more special to me when things did happen because I knew it was not me, you know, and God could really get the glory for it, but thousands and thousands of miracles. The, the one with, with the, the man with the heart attack, they prayed for him that one night and he was, he was having chest pains during the service and had been having chest pains for a couple of days and they got really severe during the service and they prayed for him and he immediately was healed. Well, the next night we were back in the same church because we were doing a revival and we had a, a missionary in that was working with us uh, and he was the actual one that was preaching and stuff and another man started having a heart attack in that service and the, the the missionary said, hey, you come pray for him. And when that man that had the heart attack the day before laid hands on him, that other man immediately got healed. You know, because it's not, it's not about us, but it's about also teaching other people that the power of God lives in them and they can also do the same kind of works that God is doing through us. And that's one of the things that we're trying to get across to the people of Tanzania is that God lives in them and the same power that was in Jesus is also in them and that they can do the signs and the wonders and the miracles and that they, they can come out of poverty and they can really have their life changed. Yeah. And they need to hear that message because they have been held, they don't understand, a lot of them don't have Bibles, they don't understand the Word of God, and so they need to hear the truth that there is more to this than just going to heaven because there's a life to be lived now and God is concerned about our life now as well as the life He has prepared for us. So let me ask you, um, because you, you had mentioned before that you thought, uh, are we too old to be missionaries? <laughs> well, if somebody was watching this, you know, right now who feels that they're, you know, they're up in age or whatever, um, and they feel like maybe their God is calling them, but they have that same thought you have, what would you tell them? I think I would, I think I would probably tell them what the Word of God tells them, you know, our years and the later times is going to be better than the former times. and. Yeah. Um, we've uh, we've seen that. I've been able to do a lot more since I've been out of work and, and being able to go myself and not having the responsibility of the children and not being responsible for taking care of a home here and and, and all those things and kind of set that, all that on the back burner just to do what I feel like God has called me to do, you know. so. I feel like our later years are going to be better than our former years, and and so I'm seeing that take place right now. So what I would say, what I would say to those people is, if you don't do it, you're going to miss out on something great in your life. The thing is, 
because of the years that we've been working in ministry and and being a part of God, we, we I mean we've lived for the Lord a long time, and so there's some wisdom that comes with that. And so when we are on the field, we have ex life experiences, and we don't have children to deal with. We don't, you know, so we don't have to worry about school, sending kids to school or homeschooling them there, and it gives us a freedom to go and do ministry. So uh, it's a great time, and I think people that are thinking about retirement and you're looking at the year stretching ahead and you're saying, is this all there is to life? This is a way to really give back to the Lord and find out that there is so much uh, that you can do and that you can make a difference. The Lord told us that if we would go, we would see millions of people get saved. That there was enough for me because my heart has always been to see people get saved and to be able to be a part of something like that, so much bigger than myself is amazing. That's awesome. It is awesome. And on the other side of that, Victor, mm -hmm. you know, the young, how old are you? Uh, 30. 30, okay. Yes. The younger, you know, uh, you're in a, in a younger spot of your life mm -hmm. and all of a sudden feeling God calling you into missions. Mm -hmm. What would you say to young people? No, actually I want to tell them uh, this is the right time for them to, to do a mission, to become a missionary and to do a good thing because uh, even, you know, because of the technology now, the youngs are taken to the technology. We are just moving according to what the world is taking us. Now, a lot of things. We are, we are doing youngs, we are doing a lot of things. But what I can tell the young men from Africa, even from America and Europe, all over the world, that they, they need to, to associate with God and not God only. If they are very busy, I see. I've bec uh, I came here in America for a few days, but I see the youngs are very busy. Most of the people, they are very busy. But they need to engage themselves, maybe to give out the, what they have so that they can support the missionaries because I see most of the missionaries, they are under the old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why it's like this, but they need to support. They need to, to give their time. Uh, sometimes I just welcome them to come to Africa. That's a uh, very nice place to do uh, a missionary trip and to do a mission. Because uh, we, have, uh, we have a different perspective. If we receive somebody from outside the Africa, yeah, actually people, they are very, they, they, they are very uh, anxious to receive. They are able to say, okay, now we got a new person. So we need to hear him. We need to, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a, this cultural difference makes us to be very attention to hear from uh, the other people who are coming to their country. So uh, I'm telling the young people, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to become a missionary. Don't be afraid to engage in a mission. Yeah, that's only. Well, I just enjoyed uh, getting to hear some more of your stories and uh, meeting you, Victor. Thank you. And uh, um, it's always been uh, uh, just even from uh, when I was a little boy, I remember sitting under the table. My parents would invite missionaries over for coffee and donuts on Wednesday nights after church. And I remember sitting under the table listening to stories as a little kid, you know. And, uh, it, it, and like you, becoming a missionary, though, had never entered my mind. Yes. And, um, but just to hear the stories of faith and how um, people who have that uh, calling to step out in faith and watch what God does, you know. It's exciting. So, um, again, thanks for joining us for Missionary Stories, uh, Glenn and Denise, LRB, and Victor. And uh, we'll be with you next time with another missionary couple or missionary single. And uh, for Missionary Stories, I'm Ian Skelly. Check us out on YouTube.com. And uh, also coming up, uh, we'll probably be broadcasting on Christian Television Network soon. So, again, thank you very much, and we'll see you guys later. God bless you.